Okay, and so I will share my screen. And I'm not going to make, uh, it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. That was one of the things I was going to suggest we check beforehand <laughs> and I forgot to. <laughs> there you go. That should uh, okay. be working now. Try again. Right. Okay, and I am not going to turn this into a presentation. Show the slides. So, um, so as I mentioned, this is a talk that I gave. Um, I, I gave an earlier version of this talk several years ago. I was invited to give a career talk. So this is focused more on my career. And this is actually the road that I drive up when I'm going to Carnegie Institution for Washington, which is where I'm currently visiting scientists, even though I am employed by NASA and my boss is in California. Um, so when you come to a fork in the road, you can go multiple directions. And that's kind of the story of my career is that I've never taken the usual route. So sort of the, the guiding principles, if you will, that I followed is sort of look for the things you don't know. I take the scientist approach rather than the engineering approach where engineers are always interested in things they know because that way they, you know, you won't get a bridge to fall down after you build it. But scientists like things they don't know because anything you know is it boring. Um, so look for what you don't know. Don't be afraid to change directions if you see something interesting, but at the same time, be persistent in following things that you think are important. Um, so the first example of this is when I was an undergrad, we were just talking about, I just mentioned that MIT started me out as uh, molecular biology. So the first semester freshman year, we were doing Southern blots in the mid 1980s. That was a few years after they had been, the protocol had been published. We went along that way for four years. And in my senior laboratory class, we were actually doing polymerase chain reaction by moving, um, in moving racks of tubes from one water bath to another. And at the beginning of that senior research lab, somebody asked the question, Neurospora crassa, is that a plant or an animal? As if those were the only two options. <laughs> Nobody had learned taxonomy. Half the students in the class didn't know what a fungus was. Um, so uh, of course, Neurospora crassa is a fungus and only one of a wide variety of fungi. So I then, that led me to go and do my graduate work in plant biology at Cornell Uni University. Um, and so there's some really interesting things about plants. And of course, if you're looking at aerospace medicine and aerospace, just biology and space, that becomes a really important question um, because we kind of need plants to be able to produce food um, or at least fungi <laughs> or yeast or something to be able to eat in space if we're going to do long duration missions. Uh, so I was looking at, um, it, I was looking at things. I was actually developing techniques for imaging tissue in novel ways, and actually you could, one could use this approach in um, space because it doesn't require a lot of, requires a razor blade and a dissecting scope, not fancy fixation equipment. Um, so trying to understand how plants were expressing um, different tissues in their mitochondria. And there's a lot of difference between plants and animals that are really cool. Um, but um, so after I finished my graduate work, I was looking for a project on something that would happen in plants, but it was better studied in animals. Um, and then so because there's more funding for health, health and medical research, I would study it in animals and then I would take it back to plants. So, um, so I went to a lab that was studying the actin cytoskeleton and um, was actually studying how the free ends of actin filaments that are in muscle tissue, and I'm not going to go through the anatomy of muscle because we're all biologists here, or at least most of us. Um, so looking at striated muscle fiber, it turns out that this protein would sit on the free ends of the actin filaments and prevent them from, um, from degrading, from disassembling as the tissue, as the myosin was pulling on the actin filaments. So that's the kind of thing you would expect. This function has to be in both plants and animals. They both have actin cytoskeletons. They both have filaments with ends and you have to keep the ends from fraying away. So it should be a plant, a function. It's a function that plants definitely need. Turns out I was at the Scripps Research Institute studying this protein and my, uh, my major advisors at Scripps's major advisor. So her grand, my grandparent, my lab grandparent, postdoc grandparent was at the Salk Institute. He discovered the one that works in plants. This one was only present in animals. It is an animal specific lineage and it shows up just as muscle tissue evolved. And if you think about life on Earth, Earth, muscles evolved once. All animals with muscles have a common ancestor. 
So that says something about how easy it is for organisms to move around a planet. It's not, it's easy to get big. You can get, you know, that organisms on earth got large up to kelp size, tree size, sequoia size, anywhere from seven to 14 times. But to be able to move, that evolved once. The whole organism moving around oh, under its own power, not being blown by the wind or run into water. So that got me in, and that, that, that was an interesting evolutionary question. And I was trying to understand how this protein evolved. But the fact that it's sitting on the free ends of actin filaments in muscle, in striated muscle tissue, and it prevents those filaments from fraying away, that's what happens in unloading atrophy from bed rest or space flight. So at that point, I um, actually found a website from NASA just as the Pathfinder mission had landed on Mars. And I sent a note to the guy at the bottom of the website saying, how do I get a job at NASA? Um, long story short, I did get the job at NASA. Um, and was turns out that the single, the yeah, nematode worms had only a single isoform of this protein that I'd been studying. I mentioned I was looking at the evolutionary evolution of this protein family. So we started looking at worms, trying to subject them to altered gravity, hoping to use them as a test system for developing countermeasures to muscle atrophy in space. Um, we put them in centrifuges. We actually got the Ames 50G centrifuge that has an arm that's like 25, no, sorry, it's like 10 meters long, eight meter long. The arm is eight meters long. It was one of the things that they used during the Apollo program to, um, to test astronaut, astronauts' resistance to hypergravity to launch forces. So we turned that thing on for four days. People came out of the Woodwork who hadn't been working at Ames for 10 years because the machine hadn't been run at that speed in decades. So if it had broken, it would have torn apart the entire building. It was pretty cool. Um, but so we put them in hypergravity and we put them in microgravity and we were able to actually grow the worms in a centrifuge for multiple days. So they would go through several generations. Um, so we're interested in the generations in space. And of course, the first time we flew worms in these little Petri dishes was on the last flight of the Columbia shuttle. So then we recovered our hardware several months after the crash. And um, that, that was able, we were able to demonstrate that the worms were able, survived the impact of several thousand G. Um, and it was the heat as, that resulted from being in an explosion or in a slowly degrading, re-entering um, disaster that killed the animals that had been on the, on the plates that were on the edges. So we then had subsequent experiments trying to understand, using worms as a model organism to understand how uh, multiple generations can happen in space. We had, um, so, so worms actually, one of my postdoc, my, my only, one of my few graduate students actually is, um, Sorry, one of my few postdocs who has continued in science has is actually continuing some of this work. He's at Nottingham University in, in England. So it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a very relevant system, um, and it's still being used in space flight experimentation. Uh, it's a, a worms are a little bit challenging because they do strange metabolic shifts. So there's a lot of relatedness to insulin signaling to starvation. Um, I mean, a nematode, the life cycle is normally a week. If you starve it in this particular medium that we developed for studying worms in space, they can survive a hundred days. So metabolic extent, life extension stuff. That's another reason why people like to use this media that we were using. It was originally developed by a nutritional expert at San Jose State University down the block from where I worked at Ames. Um, but of course, all of this research, however enjoyable and very interesting, did get me a call from the NASA Planetary Protection Officer because animals surviving a reentry event or animals surviving surviving a reentry event. If they can do it on Earth, they could might be able to do it somewhere else. So um, that got actually back to this question of planets like Earth and planets with distribution and future of life in the universe. This painting actually was on the wall of the building that I worked in at NASA Ames Research Center. It was painted in the 1960s and it shows the evolution of the universe. Basically, you start out with planets and, um, sorry, you start out over here with planetary notes, uh, nebulae, you know, solar nebulae, planetary nebulae, you form planets. 
then you start getting an influx from meteorites. You have early Earth thought to be a very volcanically active place. The ocean condenses. You start getting chemistry, carbon-based chemistry, organic chemistry, small organisms, larger organisms, multicellular organisms, big organisms, and then you start getting astronomers because, of course, astronomers are the height of evolution because they're looking out of the solar system <laughs> and looking out into space. Um, so, so this question, but the question of how does you know what happens with life, looking for life, understanding where organisms evolved, the challenge with planetary exploration when you're actually sending spacecraft to places is that it's trivial to find life. Just bring it with you. And that is the reason that planetary protection is half of the reason that planetary protection was created um, in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s as we were starting to send planetary missions off of Earth there was still actually a recollection of the 1917 flu epidemic, flu pandemic. There were the concerns that were expressed by people like H.G. Wells, just as the germ theory of disease was getting started, where you have, of course, this ancient and advanced civilization that's looking for another place to go, and they send missions there, and it turns out that the organisms in the potentially target colony planet are not very good for the people who launched the mission. That's, of course, world of the worlds from the perspective of the Martians, but... Uh, it's a concern that we ought to be thinking of. And of course, the last couple of years have really demonstrated very clearly that those kinds of things can still happen on Earth. Um, and so planetary protection at the time was created uh, out of, again, a recognition of human ignorance. And again, also even before Silent Spring and Rachel Carson, recognition that what we don't know really can hurt us. And if we are not careful, we can really screw things up. And that has only become more obvious as we start understanding the effects of human activity on our environment. And in particular, um, you know, global warming is just a <laughs> one of the major examples of that, but the pandemic is a nice, as a shorter one. So if you start thinking about war of the worlds, the motivation of war of the worlds specifically, because H.G. Wells was very interested in science, germ theory of disease was just starting to get um, recognized, accepted, and widespread. But all of these concerns about colonization come from centuries, millennia of human mobili mobility around our planet and the recognition that all of these things can cause harm. Um, there was a pretty significant, at the time H.G. Wells was writing, there was a pr pretty significant recognition of the damage the, that the colonialism of the British Empire had done to the places that they were colonizing. And then of course, with the advent of radio and newspapers and all of this public communications, then you get Orson Welles, where one of the reasons why that broadcast that Orson Welles did of War of the Worlds was hyped or, you know, it was a radio broadcast, it was a radio play. People were chiming in listening when they were, you know, interested when they had got done with dinner or something. But the concern of the newspapers that this nude medium of radio might take over, take away their readers was one of the reasons why all the newspapers published in the subsequent days, these reports about, oh, this horrible thing happened and these people were faking out the, the, everybody listening. I mean, Orson Welles and the radio station had were sued on multiple by multiple people. The only suit that was won was some guy from New York City who had spent the 20 bucks that he'd been saving up to get new shoes for, on a plane ticket, ticket to get out of town. And so Orson Welles decided to pay that one because he felt sorry that the guy needed new shoes. Um, so there's this complex interaction between public communication and public perception of what's going on, the kinds of concerns that are actually expressed. And of course, with social media these days, it's in spades where what people believe to be true and what is actually true it can be a very complex interaction um, and have really major consequences on the outcome of human behavior. So that all of that is part of planetary protection, but it's also just part of you know, being a good scientist. And then, so then just getting back to being persistent, before I started at planetary protection, I was also looking for life on earth, looking for organisms in very, um, in places where it's very hard to survive. And so you have to look very carefully and be very conscientious about not contaminating things when you start um, 
when you try to do your studies, which is of course exactly one of the things that we just had happen in the meteorite paper that came out this week, where to understand what you're looking at and being able to distinguish whether you're looking at contamination or you're looking at something that's really there. That was exactly the question for Ellen Hill's meteorite because a lot of the things they saw were potential introduction from earth. Um, and the first paper, they did a fair amount of effort to exclude that and they developed these criteria for saying, well, is this very likely or not? Um, that of course, the, the approach they took in the original Dave McKay's Ellen Hill's paper was you know, very well thought out. The conclusion, turned out to be wrong. So right now, the things I'm doing now are working with Steely and looking at how do we measure, how do we examine meteorites to um, understand what, what measurements do you, they, what measurements do you make? And then how do you interpret those measurements? And so I'm actually using Bayesian statistics to set up a framework um, to understand what, to, to give us a framework for thinking about the measurements that have been made because humans on our own are really bad at estimating risk. Uh, and so the, the, last, the last thing really is, um, it, there, there is history all the, way, all the way going back to the Colombian expansion. As humans move around the planet, we bring things with us. It's really important for us to think about the consequences of what we're doing. And that was true in 1492, 1493, this book by Charles Mann about the Columbia and expansion and how humans have traveled across the planet, what we've brought with us, with us what damage we've done, um, you know, different, different people from different parts of the planet going other places can be helpful, it can be really harmful. And we don't, and, and that potentially can be true as we go and explore space. This of course is who's being quarantined from whom. You get the astronauts on one side of the window and you got the one of our worst presidents on the other side of the window. Um, but, but these questions do not go away. We still need to think about them. Um, and, uh, and it's becoming hard because um, I, am not, I am no longer the planetary production officer at NASA. That was not a choice that I made. The subsequent planetary production officer, one of the first public things she said when she got into office was, we are no longer going to follow planetary production the way we used to do it. Um, the consequence of that has been basically, there isn't any anymore. Um, but finally, so then when you come to a fork in the road, pick it up. So I'm happy to take questions. And I hope Sorry, I cannot, so there we go. And so that didn't take too long. So. No, no, that's perfect. Um, does anybody have any kind of questions that they want to shout out? Otherwise, we have these kind of pre-submitted questions that we can get to. Um, sure. You know, either or is fine. All right. Um, seeing none, we can just kind of like jump into some of the questions. So there's this question. So what is the most exciting research you think for you um, that you've been a part of? That's actually a really challenging, I mean, I always, the research I'm doing, I always find interesting. Mm -hmm. And the research that I've thought about and haven't had a chance to get into yet is always even more interesting. So um, in terms of thought provoking this, I would say possibly the, the, the application of Bayesian statistics to the question that we want, the, the, whatever question I'm looking at. So, um, normal statistics sets a probability. You make you make a measurement, and you know based on how reliable your instrument is, you can say well, and and what the what the output is. You, it says you know you have a you know probability value of x, y, or z that this thing would happen. Um, Bayesian statistics, the you uh, can make. It starts out with your assumptions, or you have a an in you have a prior probability of something that you expect to be true. And then you make some measurements and those measurements then are fed back onto your expectation to refine the expectation to make your expectation be more resembling what you measured in reality. So it's not just the measurement, it's also what you expect about the measurement. So it's always colored by your expectation. Yeah. So for example, if you're looking for life on Mars, uh, we sent the Viking mission to Mars and they had to, each Viking lander had two experiments. 
they had a mass spectrometer that was looking for chemical compounds of life. And they had a metabolic experiment, the, life, the, the labeled release experiment that was looking for metabolic signatures of life. Hmm. To this day, up until he died really, the principal investigator who designed the labeled release experiment was regularly publishing papers saying that the labeled release experiment had found indications of metabolism on Mars, mm. biological metabolism, not in or not non-biological chemistry. Up, up until just a couple of years ago, the guy recently died. Mm. Um, measurements from Mars, <laughs> looking at the so so the the that. Pos supposedly positive result from the label ex labeled with its experiment was um, invalidated because the mass spectrometer looking for chemical signatures of life only found these very simple chlorinated uh, methane, basically, very, very simple chlorine compounds with carbon in them. Um, several of my colleagues, some of the people I've been working, had worked with, actually replicated the the mass spectrometer used a, a model mass spectrometer to measure or, uh, regular soil from the Atacama Desert and got the same result. They mixed into the Atacama Desert material the perchlorate at the concentration that was measured, detected at Mars by the Phoenix mission, and they got the same result from Atacama Desert material as the labeled really as, as the mass spectrometer on the Vikings got. So here you have one experiment that is giving you a positive result, one measurement, and the other measurement is giving you a negative result. Which one do you believe? What does that mean about life on Mars? The way it was interpreted at the time of Viking was, oh, there's not life on Mars because we didn't find dead bodies. But the measurement of the dead bodies was wrong. In fact, the people from the, who running the SAM instrument on the Opportunity, you know, sorry, the Curiosity rover, so the sample analysis at Mars instrument is a very uh, is a, a, a very carefully balanced mass spectrometer, it's different than the one that was on Viking, but possibly even more sensitive. They detected similar compounds to what was found in the Atacama Desert soil. They went back to the Viking traces that had been downloaded, and they actually found at low levels hints of these more complex organic compounds that were detected by the SAM instrument. At, at variable concentrations, so they know they're from Mars. SAM is contaminated, the, the measurements are contaminated by stuff from Earth. So they did this very careful work and they can find more complex Mars organics. So the mass spectrometer interpretation was wrong. What does that tell you? What should you believe? Um, and so when, when applying Bayesian statistics to this scenario, the probability you get out is the probability you put in. So we have no information that's believable about life on Mars, other than it reinforces what people thought in the first place. And so those kinds of, I mean, the way that science works is not you make a measurement, you believe it. The way science works is whether it's belief in the community. A correct measurement that is disbelieved doesn't change science, doesn't change you know, people's behavior, you know, people's interpretation. Um, you know, Mendel was considered wrong for a very long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how science works has to do with belief yes. as, as much, if not more so than what the data, you know, says, what right. says about fact. It, it, yeah. and, and that, of course, with social media and the way people are no longer believing fact, not even agreeing what is a fact. It, it gets back to this. It's why I said that, you know, bioethics is an important aspect of doing science. You have to understand yeah. the interaction of human culture and sociology, social behaviors, not the research, you know, the social behaviors part, not the doing research into a specialized esoteric academic field, how that intersects with the kind of learning about the you know, the, learning about the world in reality and learning facts how all the, it's all there's a lot more intersection in the pandemic in the last couple of years i think have at least for me really substantiated that i always said it but it's become blatantly obvious the what kind of harm it can do <laughs> over the past two years one thing i'm curious about that you had mentioned was that um the person that was running publishing these results there were signs of metabolism on mars and yeah. so a peer review process and that 
I'm sorry, you're fading out. I'm going to try turning off some things because I can't hear you. It's fading out for me as well. You might want to take out your headphone, Gavin. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you're good. Zoom. Um, okay, so just kind of like a recap. One thing you had mentioned was that one of the scientists that had this um, mass spectrometer on the Viking you know, rover was publishing these results saying that he had found some metabolic, you know. The label you know, release experiment. Yeah, the other, the other instrument, the label release. Yes. Yes, yes, correct. Sorry, I apologize. Um, and you were mentioning kind of the sociology aspect of, of research. And so I'd assume that there was kind of a peer review aspect, I'm hoping, to, to his research. And yet, even though his findings were not wrong because of contaminated um, you know, uh, instruments, uh, the peer review process wasn't able to quite catch that or what, what kind of happened there? What, what do you think? So, so I don't know, are you guys familiar with this physicist named Fred Hoyle? He got the Nobel Prize um, for doing physics, mm -hmm. but he has been, uh, he's dead now, but he was one of these, he, he got interested in biology and particularly in life in space and started this whole premise of, you know, advocate, advocacy for panspermia and this idea that there are viruses blowing off Venus and landing on Earth and this just totally bizarre stuff. Um, but as a, as a Nobel Prize winning physicist, he was able to get published in non-biological journals. And so he would just publish all this those bizarre astrobiology stuff in these journals. I mean, he actually founded a journal. He founded a whole institute. Um, and so just because it's a science, just because somebody is peer reviewed in a scientific journal doesn't mean the peer reviewers knew what they were doing. Um, and he, you know, even, even a well thought out paper, if you're interpreting your data incorrectly, um, you can, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you can publish in places where the reviewers don't really know what they're doing. You can publish in a journal where the, you could just pay the page chargers and they'll publish whatever you tell them to. You can publish carefully thought out work in a well-respected journal and yet still you interpreted things incorrectly. Um, I mean, actually science communication is a really interesting area for again, you know, research ethics, sociology of, in the academic sense. Um, I was, my colleague down the hall was the astrobiology senior scientist at the time when that the whole, you know, arsenic life, life in Mono Lake thing came out. And she was a biogeochemist and who was thought it was fascinating that these organisms could survive with this normally toxic compound at high concentrations. And, you know, I certainly was telling her, you want to be careful in how you phrase this stuff, because people aren't going to understand it very carefully, you know, really, aren't really going to understand. But she was, she thought, she was really psyched. She, it was, this was right down her alley. It was her back, her scientific background. She thought it was great. And we all know what happened. I was paying attention to the news at that point. And no, it wasn't really arsenic life. Um, but, but that whole, that whole, you know, tempest in a teacup, whatever you want to call it, was, more of an illustration of how people's honest expertise can, you know, scientists behaving badly can really blow up in people's, in the faces of the entire scientific community um, when, when it's done over social media in public in real time. I mean, I think one, at least personally, one experience that I've had, maybe other people have had it as well, was um, where we're, we're kind of tasked with reviewing you know, published works by, let's say, sociologists or ethicists or researchers, and then we're asked to find weaknesses mm. in these published works. Um, and I don't know about everyone else, but I have a very hard time doing that because the the vast gap in skill level and experience is, is pretty obvious. And so, you know, I even if I do feel like I have seen a weakness or I perceive some kind of weakness in their argument, I feel very, very, very hesitant to call them out because ultimately they are a senior research 
you know, a researcher or sociologist or X, Y, and Z, and I'm, you know, an undergraduate student still getting my degree. So uh, yeah, I, I guess it, it's, when you bring, when you pose it like that, I think I can kind of see, you know, how they might have been able to publish in these peer reviewed journals. When a Nobel Prize winning physicist says something is right, then how do you argue against it? But, okay. but at the same time, the people reading, I mean, for you, for you guys, you may not have the level of expertise as that other person does, but you have a certain level of expertise. And if you have a question, mm. it never hurts to ask. I mean, right. yeah, don't, don't slam somebody and shoot them down when you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. But on the other hand, things have to make sense. I was right. tut tutoring, um, I when I was at NASA headquarters, one of the people who worked I worked with, um, she was actually the, the admin assistant, very intelligent person, but not very well educated. And her from, you know, she was from South DC where, you know, African-American extraction and didn't get a very good education. Very smart person. And her daughter was having this problem because she had a teacher in high school that was not a very educated person scientifically. And I was, and she, the student, the daughter wanted to go to medical school and was not getting the grades. And so I sat down with her and basically her science education was magical thinking. And I finally said, it has to make sense. <laughs> Just because your teacher tells you this thing, if it doesn't make sense, if the, if, if the, it feels like the coin is gonna go land on the ceiling, you have experience. You have dropped pennies many times. You know they always go to the floor. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a level of common sense, I think, that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. very much so. Um, and kind of steering back into the astrobiology sense and the you know, planetary protection um, yeah. you know, side of things. And I was just kind of curious, are there ways that you feel we can leverage things such as extremophiles, you know, thermophiles, um, in order to advance our pursuits onto Mars. So I know if we're able to grow these fungi or maybe plants or life of some kind that can survive in extreme environments, can we maybe use them to uh, grow food for ourselves or you know, do anything useful of the kind? Um, well, obviously the most useful things are cats because I am, I am a good cat servant. <laughs> I'm being told that dinner time is soon, um, but so it really depends what the objective is. I mean, I'm, yeah, humans have been using biology forever, using other organisms forever. So of course we can. There, on one level, there is the question, should we? What is the objective? Uh, Carl Sagan said, you know, if there's any Mars life, it sh Mars should be left to the Martians. Do we agree with that? That is certainly not the way we've behaved on earth. And then, um, now, from a practical standpoint, yes, of course, we can grow, I mean, it's been shown that we can grow stuff on the space station. It's also been shown that if you grow the wrong stuff on the space station, you get mold everywhere. And, you know, stachybotrys is not a good thing to be bringing with you to Mars. Um, so so the, the technical aspects of growing something that can produce food, of course we can. Um, the technical aspects of understanding life from Earth that might be able to grow in places on Mars. We have already demonstrated that as well. I mean, TCR, the, you know, the hydrogen, the organisms that live in the South African mines that grow off the radioactive decay, they get hydro, they get protons from the radioactive decay of the, the material, the rocks around them, that's basalt sitting in water. If you did drill down a couple of kilometers on Mars, you will find basalt sitting in water. So it's um, the environments, there are definitely environments on Mars where Earth, like Earth communities, ecosystems could thrive. Um, that, you know, if you don't clean your water drilling process, uh, uh, the stuff on Mars carefully enough, you might drill down somewhere and introduce organisms. And some of those organisms like to turn carbon dioxide into carbonate. And if you do that, it can freeze up your aquifer and then you can't get any more water out. Um, so there's a lot of, just in, in this kind of, you know, if, you're, if you explicitly state our objective is to terraform Mars, um, then do you want to bring Clostridium tetani that lives in the soil on Earth, and then everybody on Mars will have to get vaccinated for tetanus? <laughs> um, I mean, or inoculated against tetanus? Every so, so, so there's. I mean, humans have carried organisms with us that have done good things and have done bad things. 
um, one of in that 1493 book that I showed the picture of, one of the discussion process, one of the discussions they have is the introduction of syphilis into Europe. Mm. Syphilis started spreading in Europe very as a result of Columbus's sailors bringing an organism back from the New World that probably crossed over a spirochete that crossed over with one of the spirochetes that was already endemic in Europe. And the early cases of syphilis, people's skin peeled off the entire skin. They had horribly bad blisters. It was really nasty. Mm -hmm. And it was a disease of the upper classes. So the entire ruling family of Spain pretty much died out because of syphilis. A lot of people in the ruling classes went crazy because of syphilis. Mm -hmm. What would Europe have been if that hadn't happened? Not what it turned into. So this, and these, this question of how, you know, introduced organisms can affect human societies is something that people don't think about very much. And even if we're only dealing with earth organisms on Mars, to tetanus, what if it evolves to be better off living in Mars conditions and then you bring it back to earth? Oh no. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, I, and actually one of the early things, examples that I was using, if there are Mars, Mars organisms, mm -hmm. um, they might think that Antarctica is this lovely place to grow and they'll cover over the ice on Antarctica with orange organisms that absorb infrared light and melt the ice. Mm -hmm. And I invented that in like 2008 when I was, or 2007 when I was very, early on the planetary protection officer because everybody said, well, Earth organisms, you know, Mars organisms, there's no way they'll infect humans. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to come up with a reason why Mars organisms might be bad for the Earth. Well, have you heard about the algae that grows on Greenland these days? Okay. Where it's actually melting the ice an order of magnitude faster than the models predicted because it's black. Huh. So, and, and it, that's one of the reasons why the Greenland ice sheets, I mean, Greenland, the, the ice sheet had rain on it. It was liquid for the wow. first time last, last summer. The entire ice sheet, surface of the ice sheet was melted. And part of that very explicit, very clearly was because there's so much, it's just a couple of degrees warmer than it used to be. That allows, you know, extra temperature for the algae to spread all over the Greenland ice sheet. Wow, okay. Well, that's so, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> and like you said, what we don't know can't hurt us. So yeah. yeah. Um, and as we wrap up here, I guess we'd kind of end on a, on a lighter note. So if you could share probably one of your, you know, um, favorite memories while working at NASA or you, as you currently work at NASA, you know, we've kind of had stories about international collaboration and, you know, cultures colliding and all of these things. So if you had any kind of funny memories or stories from, from your time. Oh, you uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of things and uh, the one thing so I guess my favorite memory there's two favorite memories if you will um, the first one um, was the the whole men in black thing and when I was first at NASA headquarters this group from England a TV show from England wanted to come and videotape everybody and uh, it was doing a story about planetary protection and they kept wanting us to say things using UK jargon, which we don't use because we're not from the UK. So, so it was this funny situation where the, the press person was trying to get, the, the reporter was trying to get us to, I, I was with my, um, with the, my mentor, the person who was planning for production before me, the first time I showed up at headquarters. I, I first went to NASA headquarters expecting to be there just for a year, just to learn the ropes on detail. And then I would go back and do my scientific research. And of course, this guy saw me coming and said, ooh, somebody who would actually do a good job and um, sort of you know, left me holding the bag, switched careers and left me holding the bag because that's how it had turned over every single time is that it was not something anybody wanted is you show up, the previous person realizes that you're good at it and then they leave. Um, so we weren't using this jargon, but the thing we did just as we were walking away from the last interview was um, my predecessor had sunglasses and he handed me a set of Ray-Bans and so we both put the Ray-Bans on as we walked out of the out of the interview so that was kind of fun um, and then that the other thing that the first mission that I was that was launching when I was planning a production officer was the Phoenix mission and we do samples um, you, you assay samples to understand how many earth organisms are on the spacecraft 
before it launches to Mars. And so I actually got, uh, the day before launch, I got to be up in the nose cone of the rocket taking samples off the Phoenix spacecraft. That was pretty cool. So I was probably the last person to touch the spacecraft before it went to Mars. I mean, with a swab, of course, I wasn't touching it with my fingers, but it's probably the last person to touch it before. The, the closest, the person who got closest to it last before it launched to Mars. That's pretty cool. Excellent. Well, it was truly an honor to be able to talk to you and kind of learn about your experience and, and you know, get some knowledge, not just scientifically, but also about the sociology and kind of, you know, personal and interpersonal mm -hmm. and political aspect of research. I think it's, you know, very important, especially now and as we go on into our own careers. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. We hope that you have a, you know, great rest of your day, rest of your week and all those things. And thank you, um, thank you again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks to you all for listening. And, you know, if you feel like asking me some more questions, you've got my email address. So please feel free to email and good luck in all of your future work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time.